Hello friends. Thank you for joining me again today. <clears throat> there we go. Hi, my name is Dan. <clears throat> we are going to try to do a good broadcast today. <laughs> and this is indeed Daily Art Adventure number 631. Initial drawing on a six by six foot cityscape or streetscape to be more specific. Let me show you real quickly my reference photograph. There it is. That's Fayetteville Street, my hometown. I think you could see it better if I turn off this light for just a moment. There we go. All right. So that's what I'm. That's what I'm referencing. <clears throat> I I very quickly did a quick uh, red grid on it. <clears throat> just to help me keep my measurements. And let's get to work. I have <clears throat> these nice long brushes. Somebody asked me about these yesterday. Um, they're called Jewel Plain Air. It seems a strange name to me because it seems to me that most plain air paintings want really small stuff. Be that as it may, <clears throat> I like them. I get them at Jerry's Autorama. They don't carry them in the store anymore. And I'm not positive. I think, I think they still carry them uh, on the catalog. All right. <clears throat> One foot, 18 inches. There we go. So for those of you who perhaps missed yesterday's broadcast, I am hoping that, okay, hang on. One, two and a half feet up from the bottom. I'm hoping that with this painting right here that I will, that I can <clears throat> reach a turning point in my career. Okay, hang on. Right, first thing I have to do here is about 15 inches up from the bottom, two feet, my vanishing point. <clears throat> You know what, I wasn't going to do this, but <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and grab a yardstick. So I can get away with less, uh, fewer corrections in the long run. Okay, about 15 in inches up and about two feet in. Ooh, I'm pretty close. So right there, <clears throat> I'm gonna, whoops. <laughs> I just made several happy accidents that I don't like. I don't think are very happy, so I'm actually gonna erase them. All right. So, um, here's my vanishing po point. I'm actually gonna put a circle around it. All right, for those of you perhaps who missed yesterday's broadcast, <clears throat> I'm hoping that this painting right here will be a turning point in my career. <laughs> How's that for pompous expectations? But but it's true. I, re I really do hope it. Um, and I explained this somewhat yesterday. Uh, I've had a sense for a couple of years that I want to <clears throat> allow more of the abstract underpainting to show through and I just haven't quite seen visually artistically how to do it but but I think maybe now I've seen the light so to speak so that's what I'm going to try to do is I want more six inches I want more of the abstract underpainting to remain visible down two feet to remain visible in the finished painting. <clears throat> Why? Because I think it'll make it a better painting. <laughs> same answer, same answer you understand for every, for every question. Why did you do that, Grandpa? 
my grandchildren could say. The answer is always the same, <clears throat> because I think it's going to make it a better painting. <clears throat> so why do I want more of my underpainting to show through? Because I think it's going to make it a better painting. So right at the moment, I am functioning very much in my left brain, analytical, mathematical, whatever other label you want to put on it, a logical side of my brain. And I'm drawing <clears throat> fairly carefully, as you can see, even though <clears throat> even though I, I expect, I assume that the great majority of marks that I make are going to be corrected later on in the process. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I think, uh, I think beginner painters can become somewhat paralyzed sometimes in their drawing or painting. Or they begin to rely on things like grids. <laughs> now, I think this is a fairly, liter a, a fairly legal grid because there's no grid on the canvas. <laughs> anyway, be that, whether it's legal or not, that's what I'm doing. Um, beginners can sometimes become paralyzed by insecurity. <clears throat> uh, they have every good reason to be insecure about their drawing capabilities, just as all of us do. Did, did you catch that? We all have good reason to be insecure about our drawing abilities. All right. But if you let yourself, you can just come up sort of petrified, if you will, by insecurity. So don't do that. Instead, just throw caution to the wind, sort of, <laughs> and make a line. Inside your mind, you are saying something like, hmm, as far as I can tell right now, I think this line should go here. I am almost cheating here, aren't I? Because I'm using a using a ruler. That's pretty pretty lame. <laughs> um, um, so you 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 m make a decision and you draw a line. Here's the key. Here's the key thing, is that you don't die on that line. <laughs> I'm mixing metaphors here. To, to the old analogy, the old word picture, die on that hill, you know, in battle. Say, I claim this hill, we're going to die here. Don't, don't, you make a line and you say, yeah, yeah, I'll probably be changing it later. No big deal. Does that make sense? So, so that you're not stuck in indecision. Just, just start drawing lines and assume that they're all going to be moved in, in subsequent layers. So that's what I'm doing here. <clears throat> I do assume that most of these marks are going to be moved as I proceed. I'll go, you know, later on in the drawing process, I'll go, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> that ain't right. <clears throat> um, And then you make a new mark. Now, and I think part of what is a key in, in this concept, this process, um, sometimes perhaps beginner artists, young artists, they then worry about, well, what do I do with all my wrong lines, with all my erroneous marks? If you say, just make a mark and then correct that, isn't my painting going to be a big mess full of erroneous or marks, mistaken, mistakenly placed lines? And the answer is yes. Let's see, here's good news for you. Those <coughs> erroneously placed marks uh, actually 
give your give your final give your underpainting I should say give your underpainting interesting marks interesting chaos interesting texture they add to the interest of your painting now in the final edit where you're finishing up the painting with a little bits of opaque paint here and there you can cover up any lines that are not you find unpleasant <clears throat> you just cover them up with some opaque a uh, little dab of opaque paint what i find has always surprised me is how much to what extent those uh, we're going to double check here, just a minute. Vanishing point, two feet over. It seems awfully close. Yep, that's what it says. Hmm. Boy, if I weren't, if I didn't have a grid, if I weren't measuring, I'd be really surprised that my vanishing point is that low. I would have put it about here. I think my, my intuition says it ought to go about here. <clears throat> but my intuition is wrong. So I'm, I'm using... You know, a very loose grid. I just scribbled that on there with a watercolor stick. Um, so I'm glad I scribbled the, scribbled the grid on there because that's helped me. All right. So did, did you get that point? That the, the erroneous marks um, simply add, an, add, an, add a degree of interest <clears throat> to your finished painting. And, of course, you cover up any erroneous marks that are, are uh, unpleasant, if you will, that, that don't, in fact, look good. You just cover them up. Easy. What I find is surprising is how many, how often <clears throat> the erroneous marks, in fact, look good. Let me, it's easy to describe in the negative. Let me do that. Let's, let's take this, the first line I put up here today, that line right there. <clears throat> Let's just imagine that that line ends up being exactly correct. First, first shot for, out of the gate, boom, I got it right. Well, that means with my next, and I'll, I'll be drawing this, listen to this, I'll be drawing this scene roughly eight times, eight different layers in the course, so I've got eight chances to change my mind. If every time I redraw the image, I reinforce this one line, then in a sense you could say, I wouldn't literally, but so to speak, I'm gonna have eight lines all stacked up on top of each other. Because every time I'm gonna decide, I'm gonna decide, yeah, I believe that line's right. So I draw it with a pencil, I draw it with another color, I do, I, I, you know, I do my white edge up to it and so on and so on and so forth. So it just gets getting reinforced. Boom, 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 boom. When the painting is all done, that's likely to be a very hard line. What's wrong with the hard line? Well, let me tell you the alternative. What if, as I proceed, I go, oh, you know what? I want to move this a quarter inch to the left. Oh, now half inch to the right. Now, now half inch to the left. Now three quarters to the right. Bup, bup, bup. So I have a whole series of little lines up here. All different colors, different textures, different techniques. In the final edit, just like it sounds, final edit, I decide which one line is correct. But I have all these other lines. So in my final edit, I'll reinforce the one that I think is correct. But all the other ones provide a very fascinating iteration, stop and start, to the, to the correct one. Do you see how that's a better option than the first, the first option where every line is exactly put in the same place? Ends up with a boring, straight, hard edge line. No, actually, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not actually. I'm actually not going to let that happen, even though I'm drawing as carefully as I accurately as I can right now. As the as the painting proceeds and as I draw again and again and again, <laughs> do you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> Sneaky little me, I'm going to draw lines up here that are intentional. If I think this line is right, then I'm going to draw a line beside it that's wrong that I know is wrong. Why? For the very reason I told you that. A whole bunch of lines up here and then finally edited will be much more interesting than one line all right so that should be encouraging to to many of you that uh, <clears throat> making mistakes is better than not making mistakes now and I'm speaking here I, I'm sure you, I think you can tell I'm speaking here as one who uh, is is working quite hard 
uh, at accurate rendering. I'm, I'm assuming you can tell by, by simply by looking at what I'm doing here that, wow, he's trying to get it right. He's really trying to get this correct. And you are correct. If that's your impression, <laughs> then you are right. <clears throat> Let me back up a little bit a few minutes ago. I was talking about, I hope this painting is a turning point in my career. And I, I, that's, I know that's rather almost pompous language. I mean, it just sounds, I don't know, pompous. <laughs> um, in a, in, I want to give you a bigger context. For the past um, five years, I would, I would think, at least, maybe more. So again, you, I don't know, if, you, you might see one or two paintings on my website, dannelsonart.com. Go to my paintings, oil over, acrylic, oil over acrylic paintings. Go to that page and you might see one or two paintings. No, you will see one or two paintings from two years ago or more. Excuse me. <coughs> Woohoo! Yes. Sadly, I am still fighting a bad cold flu thing. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, you might, you might be able to find um, some paintings that go back as far as five years. Be that as it may, for the last five years or more, I have had a conscious, stated, you know, written down, stated out loud objective in my painting uh, journey <clears throat> to, for my paintings to be more accurate, more literal, realistic, comma, and more messy. Okay, so that's, that's a, a bigger context for understanding this, what I'm talking about today, that I hope this painting, with this, with this painting, to allow more of the underpainting to show through. So that would be a big step in the more messy direction, right? And to me, it's, I was gonna say almost, no, it's not, all, it's not almost at all. My objective is to make my paintings, pulling from this way, make them more realistic. <laughs> It takes work to get things realistic. Now, of course, I don't mean by that tiny brush tongue painting detail. You understand that if you follow me, but more realistic, more accurate in every way, more accurate, not more detailed, more accurate. Okay, that's pulling this way. But on the other end, pulling this way is more messy, more loose, more abstract, more ex expressive, that's a dangerous term because I'm not trying to express myself here, you understand? Anyway, so I'm trying to pull these two together. Does that make sense? Um, which gets right to the heart, actually, of philosophically what I believe uh, is the, the best artwork in the world. Over the centuries, over the millennia even. What do two dimensions? I'm limiting, limiting my conversation here to two dimensions. Um, what is it that people like to see? And the my answer is it is these two things squeezed together, and the the uh, grand champion god of us all <laughs> in this regard is in fact uh, Rembrandt. <clears throat> there are lots of other good painters as well. American John Singer Sargent, he pulled these two together. But uh, the, if you will, the godfather of us all in, the, in this regard would, would have to be, um, in my opinion, it would have to be Rembrandt. Um, as some of you also, since you see me laboring here to doing a loose grid there and using my yardstick to measure things over here, uh, you may rightly say, well, why don't, you just, why don't you just do a grid? And in fact, if you've been watching me for a while, I, I, the last, uh, I think the last two cityscapes that I did, which were four by six feet, so not quite this big, but still fairly large, I did in fact use a grid both times sort of under protest, if you will. 
um, internal protest in, inside my own mind. It's like, oh, I don't really like doing this, but I'm do it anyway. Um, let's talk just for a minute about what I, with a wink and a good natured, good natured wink, what I call cheating, okay? I've given this, this little talk many times, but maybe you weren't there, so let's just do it really quickly. Um, by the way, I just changed my mind right there. See, that, that was my first mark. I said, that ain't right. I moved it over. Um, I'm moving this line over. Um, all cheating. What is cheating? Cheating is any photomechanical method used for capturing an image. A grid is one of the simplest. So I'm barely cheating here. Do you understand? Because I, I just a hand-drawn grid, not a careful measured one, just quick scribbled, and no grid here, but using a yardstick. So it's a tiny bit of cheating. All right. Here's all, <laughs> and every time I talk about this, somebody leaves a comment and says, I don't think it's cheating. Okay, here's my definitions. Sorry, my, my broadcast, my definitions. <laughs> but I'm, be, I'm being nice to you here. Um, all cheating is legal. Most of the great masters through history, Vermeer, Titian, you know, all the great, great artists of the Renaissance, we know, most of them, in fact, cheated. That was the theme of Hock, David Hockney's groundbreaking book about 10 years ago. I forget what it was called, but you can Google it. David Hawking, groundbreaking book. You know probably about uh, the masters cheating. Um, so again, all cheating is legal. It's all legal. If you need to cheat to get the job done, make yourself free. Um, just a little funny, kind of close to home story. Um, when I first moved to Raleigh, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, <clears throat> 30 years ago, I quickly found and joined the, the best art association here in town. Hang on, Jessica, I need to think for a minute. There we go. And uh, it was North Carolina Association of Designers and Illustrators. It was mostly illustrators, not entirely, but mostly. All right, one of the members of that group was David Snyder. I've forgotten his name, that's tragic. He passed away about 15 years ago now. He was the, uh, forgive me, I should look up his name. He was the founding president of the Society of Illustrators uh, in New York City, I think back in the 50s, I think. Okay, so, and he had moved for the, they retired in Chapel Hill. So he was a part of, he was an old guy, great, great artist, illustrator. And uh, the reason I, I tell the story is because he, connect, he connects us. He was a personal friend artist friend of Norman Rockwell. Slightly younger than Norman Rockwell. So I think that's kind of cool. I had, I had a friend who was a friend of Norman Rockwell. That's pretty, that's pretty close. One degree of separation. Or that's, if that's called two, be that as it may. <laughs> Who's counting? Um, anyway, David, my friend David, walks into a uh, Norman Rockwell's studio one day <laughs> and good old Uncle Norman was quite flustered and embarrassed because David had caught him cheating <laughs> and forgive me I don't remember exactly in, in what manner grid tracing projecting but it, would, it definitely involved the camera and photography <laughs> and and uh, you know, some quick method of cheating. So that's just funny. That, and again, that's, that's for those of you who say, well, if there's anybody out there who says, no, no, cheating is never allowed, nah. More of you are likely to say, no, cheating's, all right. Here's the big but. So are you, the, 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 this, my statement is all cheating, quote unquote, and I say that tongue in cheek, all cheating is legal, okay? Big, there's a big but coming. Brace yourself. There's a big but coming. All cheating is legal, but every time you cheat, 
your skills deteriorate. Your ability to draw suffers. Oh, ouch, ouch. And I don't know about you. And I, by the way, I, ex I learned this the hard way from firsthand, ex it's happened to me. As an illustrator, I spent you know, 30 years, more or less, as a full-time illustrator, more or less. And um, being an illustrator, sort of the, the definition of being an illustrator is cheating. Because you have to have the, a portrait of the bank president done tomorrow, and it's got to be perfect. You don't have time to do any this kind of stuff. You with me? So you cheat. That's what illustrators do. That's why Norman Rockwell was quote unquote illustrate cheating. Okay, but uh, every time you cheat, your skills deteriorate. So after several years, I discovered that my ability to draw had suffered, had gone downhill. And dog gone it. You want to talk about me being creeped out or freak, freaked out? It's like, ah! <laughs> it was a moment of horrible revelation. <laughs> and um, so th to this day, I cheat when I have to. When I'm, when I'm, if I'm being paid for a job, which by definition means, <laughs> which by definition means I'm not being paid enough for the job, illustration job, right? Even, even if I'm being paid well, you know, I have not, I'm, I'm doing this for money. I got to get the job done. Uh, I cheat if I have to. You bet. Of course. What do you think I am? Stupid? Um, but, but if I can get away without cheating, I do. <clears throat> that's the way I do my portraits. Uh, that's you've seen my mirror image. Go back a couple days. The last couple, last week, the last broadcast I did. Hang on a second. I need to think. One, two, three, three feet four inches. Bear with me for just a minute. Three feet. One, two, three, four. Right about there. So again, what I'm doing right here is, you know, you'd have to call this cheating. It's a very mild cheat. Um, which, by the way, there are degrees of cheating, right? I mean, the most cheaterly cheating <laughs> is uh, projecting and tracing. Please understand, it's legal. Drew Struzan, two, two of the titans of illustration in America. Drew Struzan, probably the most famous movie poster artist maybe of all time certainly the top th one of the top three of all time drew struzan s-t-r-u-z-a-n he cheats totally all the time and he's fantastic but do you know what i know about him his drawing skills have deteriorated Ab no question the other one the other the other uh titan of american illustration might be uh, Drew Blair. There's two, there's two Drews. Drew, T Drew Struzan and Drew Blair. Drew Blair's the, if I can just be simple, the greatest airbrush painter in the world. Um, if you see him, tell him I said so. Say, hey, Dan Nelson keeps calling you the best airbrush illustrator in the world. He will smile and say, yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, he used to live in Raleigh. Had the great privilege of... So, so to speak, working with Drew years and years, 25 years ago. Mostly I had the great privilege of just watching him work, which was worth, which was worth a, roughly a master's degree in art, just watching Drew work. Um, anyway, cheats, traces, trace, 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 trace. Now let me throw in a caveat here, because I'm talking about cheating as though it's the panacea as though it fixes and cures all your drawing ills. <laughs> Some of you are already nodding and laughing or shaking your head because you know, uh-uh. <laughs> all, all the tracing, let's say, you, you have a projector back there. It used to, be, used to be an overhead projector. Now it's an opaque, now it's a, or an opaque projector. Now, of course, it's a digital projector. I have all of these. <laughs> Still have my opaque projector. Um, and, and you project up here and you draw with a pencil, okay? Honestly, you all know, that only gets you kind of like in the ballpark. That doesn't get you home free. Talking about Drew Blair, again, look him up. In fact, if you want to have some fun, just for fun, next time you're, don't go now because you're watching me <laughs> on your other computer. 
uh, just Google these words. This is not a photograph. This is not a photograph. And if that doesn't get you to Drew Blair, then this is not a photograph, D-R-U, Drew. By the way, the other Drew Struzan is D-R-E-W. I'm getting too deep, aren't I? Drew Struzan and Drew Blair, they both cheat. But anyway, um, the, tr the tra project projecting and tracing part of the process only gets you started. Drew Blair is a genius. And his genius is all the stuff that he sees after the tracing is done. Okay, that's why people go and take lessons from him so he can teach them. Did you notice that this, that, this, that, and the other? And everybody goes, uh-oh, I never noticed that before. <laughs> so that's what, that's what geniuses do for us, you understand? Anyway, I, cheating is legal. But your skills deteriorate. I, I sometimes say it humorously, I say cheating is legal, but every time you cheat, your head shrinks. <laughs> I just like the, I just like the picture. <laughs> I heard an expression last night. Somebody was quoting, I think, quoting their mother. And they said, uh, "So and so was so narrow-minded, their ears chafed. Their ears rubbed together. I, I can't remember what word they used, but anyway, so narrow-minded, their ears rubbed together." So, yes, if you keep cheating <laughs> as an artist, eventually your ears will start rubbing together. <laughs> None of this is literally true. You needn't worry. Don't go look at the mirror. Your head is not shrinking. I'm just using, shall we say, picturesque language. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, to give you a, a bottom line, then, for me, uh, my solution is, has been that for years, cheat when you need to a little bit so that you're still exercising that brain muscle that allows you to copy stuff, okay? Uh, and again, my, the way I do portraits in this season is a good example of that. I don't, I, sometimes I grid, sometimes I... Um, I guess that's it, a grid, but um, I use the photo, the mirror, looking at a thing in a mirror, and my phone provides a mirror image by flapping it. That's enough said, you can get a lot more just by going and watching it yourself. Um, but when I do that, then I'm, the, through the entire process, I'm still exercising my drawing skills. Uh, because you can do what you want. I do not like the idea of my head shrinking. I do not like the idea of skills deteriorating. Enough said. Probably way too much said, I know, but... So here I am. I'm still... Now I'm coming down into tree stuff. Let me show you the, my image again. Can you see that? Yeah. I know it's still, that's still pretty small, but it gives you an idea. <clears throat> few chats. I look forward to getting to you there in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I don't usually do the entire drawing in one color. I think I got carried away because I was having such a fine t time talking to you guys. I'm going to switch a little bit here. How much detail do I want to do? I'm I'm not sure. These buildings over here. Oh, I was going to say, I'm coming down now to trees, tree level. Um, and um, I was going to say, part of the reason, by the way, a big part of the reason that I enjoy painting architecture Hang on, 14 inches. Uh, a big part of the reason I enjoy painting architecture 
uh, is because I like the juxtaposition of straight lines, hard edges, they won't all be hard when I'm done, of course, but straight lines and organic shapes. I like the two together. It, the, or to put it negatively, if you will, the reason I don't particularly enjoy doing uh, nature scenes, which sounds like, what do you mean? Everybody loves nature. Well, I do love nature. But from a purely abstract visual point of view, um, now I don't enjoy painting mountains and trees and a rippling brook and a waterfall and grass. Why? Because there's no straight lines. You know what I mean? You, know, you might say, well, the trees are straight. Nah, they're organic. Anyway, but if you throw a castle or a cabin or something in the, in the, in the mountain scene, then I like it. <clears throat> so that's really, it's a, 15 years ago when I started doing uh, quote unquote fine arts painting, I had immediate, instantly, I had a, a gravitation toward um, toward architectural scenes, and that has persisted to this video. Hang on just a minute. I am not happy with about something. Hang on. A mistake in here somewhere. So here we go. <clears throat> I'll zoom in here for just a minute. Hope and pray that I remember to unzoom in a minute. So this whole structure right here, I just discovered is way too high. So I discovered that when I started drawing the windows in there. It's like, wait, something's not measuring up here. All right, so, so there's, all these lines are erroneous, are, are mistakes. Does that make sense? And as I like to say, Witness my distress. <laughs> there ain't any. <laughs> okay? Because I know that these erroneous lines will in fact serve to make my finished painting more interesting. All right, so I'm going to go back to why I do architecture is because I like the, the juxtaposition of straight lines and organic shapes. Uh, by the way, these long-handled brushes are really good for, I'm, I'm envisioning my uh, vanishing point down there. Does that make sense? So, a couple good reasons for using the long. By the way, if, if Jerry's Artorama no longer sells uh, these, I'm not sure if they do or not in their catalog. When they did a close uh, a clearance sale at, at their store, I went in and bought like 30 of these brushes. So, I haven't bought any in quite a while. Uh, Rose, the Rosemary Brush Company, very, very, one of the, some of the best brushes in the world, Rosemary, in, in the UK. Uh, they, they sell long-handled brushes. I own one. I look forward to owning more. Um, back to why I draw cityscapes, why I draw um, Architecture. The other re couple other reasons. One is I really do enjoy architecture. I enjoy beautiful buildings, especially tending toward more ornate Victorian kind of stuff. I just love that stuff. I think I think it's so much fun. Um, for some reason, my brain just gets a kick out of. Okay, so this this line is also wrong. That is to say, those lines up there are wrong. Um, I'm, I'm, there's still more. <laughs> the third reason I paint architecture, especially cityscapes, is because this is, in fact, my city. And some of you will understand this, some of you won't. I have a, even though I've only lived here 30 years, I have a certain degree of pride, maybe loyalty. I'm not sure that's the right word, but, you know, home team, rah, rah for Raleigh. That's kind of what I feel like. And uh, I, th I, I actually advocate that kind of spirit. <laughs> it's, it's closely related to, to Thanksgiving, thankfulness. People who are thankful are, are 
you know, generally well adjusted and joyful. People who are not thankful are generally maladjusted and unjoyful. And there you go. There's some, there's a irritatingly close to a sermon for you. Want to be happy? Be grateful. Want to be a sorry old, you know what? Don't be grateful. Anyway, so I'm very grateful for my hometown. A lot to be grateful for, frankly. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty fine place to live. All right, so I'm, I'm proud of my town, so to speak, and glad to paint it. Third, fourth reason. Um, people, oh, so a, a, a gallery owner told me this years ago when I was first, first, first getting into uh, fine arts gallery painting. He said, people tend to buy paintings of things that they know or by people they know. In other words, I can say that again. People tend to buy paintings, paintings of things that they know or paintings by people that they know. And uh, that has certainly been my observation as well, that my paintings of Raleigh tend to sell very fairly well in the city of Raleigh. Now, one of my young friends, this quote has since become quite, I've repeated it many times, one of my young friends, we were working in a, we were making a video, and he said to me, he said, Dan, you're never gonna get famous painting Raleigh. <laughs> and he's right, he was correct. But without even thinking, <laughs> That's why I think it might have been this, the source of this wisdom was from beyond myself. Without skipping a beat, I said, I don't plan to get famous painting Raleigh. I expect Raleigh to get famous because I painted it. Woo! Psh! Now, either that's the ultimate in arrogance. <laughs> but I just did. After I just drew all those windows wrong because I I failed to make the correction. All right, so I have to draw them all again. Sorry. Anyway, so that's either the ultimate in arrogance, like how can you be so arrogant? Or it's something better than that. Um, my model in this regard, forgive me for even aspiring to compare myself to uh, one of the gods of American 20th century art, Andrew Wyeth. Andrew Wyeth essentially only painted one thing his entire career. And that was his farm at, in Pennsylvania. I forget right now what the name of the farm. It has a name. You can look it up, Google it. Just Andrew Wyeth's farm. He only painted basically one thing his whole life and it was his farm. And it's now uber famous because he painted it. So he didn't he didn't get famous. He, <laughs> He got famous because he was good, but his farm got famous because he painted it. So that's what I'm looking for. So I'm not, uh, painting your hometown is not, I mean, yeah, there have been times that I, I've, many times that I've wished, doggone it, I wish I lived in New York or, not really, but I thought about New Orleans or San Francisco or something, you know, like that. Someplace a little more sexy, maybe. But here I am, bloom where you're planted. So those are the four reasons I do so much architecture. And one, organic versus straight lines. Two, I like architecture. Three, uh, it's, I'm proud of my hometown. Four, it sells well. And that's why I tend to paint, probably will for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Continue to paint my hometown. I do enjoy painting other towns as well. A trip to Toronto, Canada, my dad's birthplace, a couple years ago, filled me with envy. <laughs> architecture envy, big architecture envy. It's like, man, why couldn't I live in Toronto? They have fantastic buildings. A lot of old world, you know, old world looking stuff. European looking stuff up there. I just switched to purple by the way because purple is slightly darker than the blue I was using. Um, so
so it helps me to make corrections. So now I'm using the, you know, following the purple lines here instead of the blue ones. That's a good trick too. All right, I think I'm going to wrap up this broadcast here because I'm just going to be doing more of the same for a while, and I've rambled on and on and on. Let me read some of your chats before I go, and then I'll paint without you. Thanks, you guys, for watching. Uncle Sixty, good to see you again, Horatio. I'm watching with Florida people. Welcome, Florida people. Good to have you on board if you're still there. Hello, Aunt Karen. <laughs> good to have you on board. <laughs> It is a big one, Barbara. Six by six. I've got two canvases this size, and I think I'm thinking I'm going to do the same street, looking north and looking south. So it'll be a pair. Maybe they'll sell as a pair. Ah, Franz. Hockney's book was called Secret Knowledge. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Franz. Appreciate it. And um, Barbara, I, I I agree with you absolutely. I like the the process of freehanding, making those mistakes, and then getting back in line, right? But it doesn't work if you don't give yourself permission to second guess. So that's the big thing that I encourage students all the time. You know, don't just don't trust your first marks. It sounds like you're doing the right thing. Hello, Marlene. Good to have you here again. Oh, good. You're leaving a lot of white already. <laughs> so you're ahead of me, Marlene. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> good job. By the way, I did get your comment yesterday about moving out. of. You know, you've been a tongue painter your whole life. Um, you know, t take as much of me as is appropriate for your place in your journey right now. You know that. <laughs> and Benji, new name. Ah, good. Benji likes the, the abstract, curvy, and straight lines. Good. Thank you, Benji. I do, too. In fact, here, before I go, let me, let me move you guys, give you a little bit of, of an earthquake ride here for a minute. And... Uh, show you you know why i want to keep um so much of the abstract it's this kind of stuff this kind of texture that you you just can't you can't make that stuff up you know what i mean all the all the mistakes i don't mean mistakes but uh, uh, yeah happy mistakes all the incidental things that happen when you just throw paint around i like that so much and and it is that kind of stuff that I'm anxious to have that still show up. How much? That'll be a judgment call, step by step by step, won't it? But uh, that's what I'm anxious to have still remaining in the final painting. All right, thanks guys for watching. If you haven't subscribed, Aunt Karen, subscribe now, would you? <laughs> thanks guys, bye-bye. <laughs>